Okay. Welcome back everybody uh, to 162. Um, today we're going to pick up where we were last week on Tuesday uh, and talk about file systems. Uh, and uh, just remember, if you have any questions, just type them in the chat and uh, we'll try to get it to everybody. So uh, just to remind you of where we were, we were uh, talking about building file systems. And one of the things that we talked about was uh, the fast file system, which originally started in 4.1, back before it was the fast file system. They didn't actually call it the slow file system. But uh, an inode basically was defined in the following fashion, where uh, a 128-bit structure would point at data, and that inode structure would have uh, things like all of the metadata for the modes and owner and timestamps and so on, and then a set of direct blocks, singly indirect blocks, doubly indirect blocks, et cetera. And uh, if you remember, a direct block points directly at a data block. The single indirect points at a block, which points at data. Doubly indirect points at a block, which points at a block, which points at a data, uh, et cetera. And uh, this particular structure, as you might recall, was uh, put together as a way of basically getting uh, support for uh, very efficient support for short files, but also being able to support long files fairly well. And so the short files are ones that are all direct pointers, and the big files are ones that probably use the double and maybe even triply indirect blocks. And uh, these data blocks are numbered in some sense file order in the following way. You start at zero, block zero, work your way through all the direct blocks, and then you work your way through the singly, doubly, triply, et cetera, indirect blocks. And so, you know, 10 direct pointers. So to get to any of the first blocks there, first 10 blocks is a single hop. Um, to access block 23, assuming that this uh, inode's already open, um, you just basically have to grab the uh, indirect block and then um, block 23, which would be the 13th block down. And uh, keep in mind that these uh, indirect blocks here have a tendency to get pulled into the buffer cache. And as a, as a result, uh, after you pull one in, then it's pretty efficient. All right. How about block five? Uh, block 23, you have to go to the indirect blocks. Block five, you could grab it directly. Block 340, turns out you have to go through the doubly indirect blocks to get there. And uh, this is a computation we're assuming that would be very easy for you to do. So the pros and cons of this original structure, um, the pros where it's more or less pretty simple and it uh, nicely optimizes for short, uh, files and long files, and uh, you get this easy expansion up to a point. And um, some of the cons, though, in the original BSD was you had lots of uh, seeks because there was no particularly close placement of the data blocks. And so that led to the fast file system, which was in 4.2 BSD, where uh, there was a lot of attention to uh, how to lay out the data blocks in a way that gave you great locality. And that's what we talked about last time. And uh, just so you know, so BSD uh, obviously was Berkeley standard distribution. So that's yay Berkeley, right? Um, EXT2 and 3 from Linux is uh, essentially uh, in the direct uh, line of this file system data. And so EXT2 and 3 from Linux uh, is pretty close. It has a couple more direct pointers. It goes all the way out to triply indirect blocks and uh, the blocks are 4K kind of by default. So, um, but it's very similar. So are there any questions on this before I move on? Everybody good on these ideas? All right. So uh, moving on, we, uh, oops, there's a question. How many indirect blocks? So uh, the number of indirect blocks are, uh, so the direct blocks are here. The indirect blocks, there's a single, singly indirect block attached directly to the inode. There's a doubly indirect block that has singly indirect blocks and so on. And so there's kind of one of each of these varieties. All right. And the pointers are, the number of pointers are basically, you know, in the original BSD, there were 10 direct blocks. In Linux, there are 12 and so on. Um, the number of pointers in, a, in an indirect block like this depends on the size of a block versus a pointer. 
And so if you have, uh, say, a 4K uh, block, indirect block, then uh, certainly 32 bits is more than enough to point it into data. So you could get 1,024 data pointers within an indirect block. Yep, only one of, there's only, the question continuing here, there's only one singly indirect, one doubly indirect, one triply indirect, and so on. Okay. Now, uh, the thing that we were actually talking about at the very end last time was we were talking about caching. And in caching, as I've said before, operating systems are all about the cache. And so uh, in the middle of the operating system, we have something called the buffer cache. And the buffer cache is kind of a generic cache used for all sorts of stuff. Uh, file data is one of its primary uses, but it's also um, holding things like inodes and directory contents, uh, name translations, et cetera, are all stored in the buffer cache. And so the key idea here, as with any cache, is uh, we're going to exploit locality in uh, the disk data to get us better performance. And that locality, including things like name translation, is often there because typically you open a uh, you open a path and then you uh, operate on a bunch of files in a directory and so the name translations are cached and the disk blocks have a lot of locality to them especially if you're doing sequential accesses um, so uh, the buffer cache is uh, this thing as i mentioned used to cache all these things and it's typically a single uh, entity that's that's managed in this in the uh, in the middle of the cache for handling all handling all sorts of stuff the question that's uh, asked here is sort of how frequently do we flush dirty cache blocks back to disk? So uh, that varies a lot by operating system, as I'll mention, uh, with uh, the typical Unix variants uh, in kind of default mode, 30 seconds is often the, the number that's used there. So we'll talk more about this as we go on. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a graphical view of this, just so you know. So we have the uh, process control blocks with their file descriptors, and we have the disk. And somehow between uh, the user reading and writing stuff and the disk, there ought to be something in the middle to try to make it a little faster, and that's going to be the buffer cache. And so the buffer cache you can think of is something, uh, it's a set of memory set aside to hold a bunch of blocks that go across different processes. So this is between all the different processes and users of the disk. And uh, every block is going to be a 4K block, for instance, if our, if our blocks on the disk are 4K. And it's going to have state, like whether they're free or not. And um, what I'm going to do here is these blocks, uh, yes, are handled uh, in an LRU fashion, we'll mention in a moment, in the buffer cache. But you could think of them logically as there are some data blocks, which we have a gray, there are some inodes, there are some directory data blocks, and there's sort of the free bitmap itself uh, as well. And these things are all. Uh, mappings of what's in our cache and of course they're cached versions of what are on disk and so if a user goes to access some data or open a file or whatever and it's already in the cache then we can get very fast access otherwise we've got to start involving the disk somehow okay and just to give you an example um, so for instance if you already have a file open and you've been accessing it then the uh, file descriptor Part of your PCB is probably pointing at its inode and it's already in memory somewhere and you can just access quickly. On the other hand, if you're trying to do an open for a brand new file, then what? Well, then if things are not necessarily in the buffer cache, you got to start moving forward with a process. And so, uh, for instance, you might have to start reading the, uh, the, the directory off of the disk, assuming that there's an inode for that directory that's already been loaded. And so one of the things you're going to do is you're going to allocate a new block and mark it in a transient kind of read state uh, where this says that this block is kind of halfway between the disk and memory. And then you're going to start a read going. And that may take a while. If you remember, we said uh, this no, the one number that I keep telling you guys to remember, other than pi, of course, is uh, you know about over a million instructions are typically lost on our way to reading. And so clearly, uh, this process may be trying to do an open, but we're going to put it to sleep while we're busy reading uh, data for the directory off disk. Eventually, that gets put in its uh, place, and now this maybe gets marked as a directory block in the buffer cache. And, uh, and now we can logically think of it as available, 
in which case we can now look up, say our file that we're trying to look up, we can find out what I number it is that we're looking for. And now we look in you know, the blocks that we have that are cached for inodes and we find out, oh, that's not, a, that's not in our memory yet. We've got to go to disk. And again, we're going to mark a uh, block in the buffer cache as, as uh, uh, busy, transient, uh, not freeable yet. We're going to go ahead and do the read. Uh, and then eventually that will come back and it'll be read, uh, read into memory and we'll uh, mark that as an inode. And at that point, um, you know, we can actually mark the file descriptor for our open uh, inode and start dealing with our data. And so in that case, we might have to read blocks off of disk and, and the reading of blocks that are data blocks is gonna be similar to what I just showed you, so we're not gonna go through it. But these gray blocks can also be cached. Okay, and so for reads, we're gonna pull things off of the disk into the buffer cache and then into the process. And if you remember, one of the things that we talked about a couple of lectures ago was we said, look, the user's view of a file is a stream of bytes. The system's view underneath the covers is a bunch of blocks. And so especially if the user reads a few bytes, we're gonna pull the block into the memory so that we can then give them those few bytes. But if they ask for the next few bytes, we pull them directly out of the cache. So this is uh, the buffer cache is part of uh, not only how do we reduce uh, performance penalty by going to the disk all the time, but also how can we help match the user's view, which is bytes, with the system's view, which is blocks. And we do that by putting the blocks aside so that we can uh, handle multiple reads to them. Writes, of course, are tricky. Because if you write a few bytes, you're not going to write through to disk, OK? You absolutely aren't. Because again, that's a million instructions worth of time just to write a few bytes to disk. Not a good idea. So writes are, by and large, going to go into memory. And in fact, you're going to have to do read modify write. Because if you write a few bytes and there's already a block out on disk, you got to read the block into memory first, then modify the bytes, and then mark it as dirty, OK, for later flushing. And of course, in order uh, to allow you to write a stream of bytes over a couple of successive system calls, you're not going to flush the disk right away. And we're going to start getting to that question, which was asked earlier, how many, uh, you know, how long is dirty data in the cache? And that could easily be seconds, 30 seconds, okay, which is going to start uh, causing some issues for us as we start thinking about it a little bit. But um, so, Blocks being written to disk go back through transient states. If you remember, for instance, when we were talking about uh, paging and we we're talking about replacement policy, one of the advantages of the final free list version where we coupled the clock with the free list, which was kind of like a second chance list, was that we could uh, pull blocks that were about to be freed and put them on the free list and then start them being written back to data if they're dirt, back to disk if they're dirty. And then by the time the blocks got all the way to the head, then hopefully they've been written back and they're ready to go and they're clean. And so those blocks go through a set of transient states uh, for writes and for eviction. Okay. All right. So what about the buffer cache? Well, it's written in it's implemented entirely in the software. Um, this is unlike uh, memory caches and the TLB, which is hardware supported. Uh, the blocks go through transitional states, as I mentioned, between free and in use. Uh, so being read from disk, being written to disk, et cetera. Uh, other processes can read or write. So for instance, um, if process A writes some data and then process B reads from the same file, the buffer cache will actually catch the reads of the second process. And so even though the data hasn't made it to disk yet, the second process gets the correct data back. Okay, so the buffer cache uh, is catching all reads and writes to make sure that we have a consistent view in a single node. This gets a lot trickier when we start talking about distributed file systems, which we're not quite there yet. Now, so blocks, as I mentioned in the buffer cache, are used for many purposes, inodes, data for directories and files, free map, um, and the operating system maintains pointers into them while they're in the buffer cache, and essentially, what we mean by some of these transient states is that these buffers are essentially locked during different periods of time when uh, they can't be uh, replaced while they're being read in or written out, et cetera. 
Okay. What happens on termination of a process? Well, at that point, we got to flush all the data out of the user's buffers and into the buffer cache at least, and then possibly out to disk if it's requested by the process. So you might ask a question about what happens when the buffer cache gets full. Uh, and really, that's pretty much all the time because you're going to keep as much data as you possibly can in the buffer cache. So after a little while after rebooting the system, pretty much the buffer cache is full. And so now what? Well, LRU is easy enough to do. Uh, so unlike when we were dealing with replacement in virtual memory, where to compute LRU, we had to essentially uh, rearrange our blocks on every access, which would be way too expensive. And so we went to a clock algorithm. Here, we have the potential to do LRU uh, because really we're only rearranging blocks when we are replacing whole um, buffers, either pulling them in off of disk or uh, sending them out to disk. And so we can keep a linked list if we want. Okay, so LRU might actually be a good policy here. And it's a nice approximation, as we've said in the past, to min, which is kind of the uh, oracle that finds the page that's going to be uh, replaced longest in the future. But um, there are some disadvantages, which are there are some types of accesses that you absolutely don't want cached. A great example I give here is uh, you find, um, and this find is a, this is a pretty cool syntax if you guys haven't seen this before, where you go to a directory and you say find starting in that directory. Uh, you're going to go for every file in that directory, and you're going to execute uh, grep for foo. And this funny little double brace means insert the file name in there, and backslash colon says that's the end of, of this command. And so what this find will do is this will ex actually execute um, for every di directory and or every subdirectory and every file underneath the current directory, it will execute grep foo to find something. So you guys should keep that in mind. But if you do this at the top of a terabyte size file system, you're clearly going to blow out your cache by filling it up and replacing and replacing and replacing and uh, never getting any benefit from caching. So there's a good example where LRU isn't going to help you any because uh, you're basically kicking out things. Um, now, there's a, there's a good question that's uh, on the chat here, which is sort of how do you prevent a process from accessing a block in the cache that's being evicted by another process? Well, the answer is you don't prevent it. You do what we said about uh, second chance list. So until the page is absolutely out of the system, you uh, have the potential for a process that accesses it to bring it back in uh, and uh, tell it to you know, come back into the active set. Okay, so you don't actually have to lock the entire cache. What you do is you start the process of writing it out. And uh, when you finally finish that up, uh, you know, on the interrupt from the disk saying the file is done, then at that point, you can, um, you're in the interrupt context or you're right off the interrupt context so nobody can be accessing it. So you can free it at that point. Or if it gets uh, reused in the meantime, then you just bring it back in. And the only thing that's happening is you're writing the dirty data out. And when it comes back, it's uh, clean. Um, another question here, in the case where all blocks are being used um, and the cache is full, uh, um, let's see, in another process, P1 requests some data that's on disk. Do we wait or sleep on P1 until the block in the cache is no longer used? So the, uh, there's a lot of different questions here that one could have about things that are in a transient state. Uh, if there's data and it's valid in the cache, say it's dirty and it's being written out to disk, then you could certainly satisfy reads. On the other hand, if you're reading it in from disk and there's no data there, then if a second process goes and asks for it, you're going to have to put it to sleep. So there, there's a lot of different questions, a lot of different scenarios you can come up with and uh, asking whether a, a second process is allowed to access or not is really a question for uh, thinking through the scenarios. Um, and you just got to think through which ones are going to make sense from a, from a consistency standpoint, which aren't. Uh, so, um, so if uh, there's another question about uh, encountering cache co incoherency if our system has multiple physical disks, no problem. 
as long as it's one node, okay? Because the buffer cache helps all. So if you think about this buffer cache, there's no reason there can't be many physical disks behind it. The buffer cache is the, uh, the gatekeeper between all processes trying to read and write. So as long as you're on one node, no problem. The moment you go to multiple nodes, potential problem. And that's when uh, things are going to get interesting when we start talking about uh, across different physical nodes where the buffer caches are now unique. Then we got a problem and uh, got to start thinking carefully there. But as long as it's one node, multiple disks don't matter because everything goes through a single buffer cache. Okay. So um, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, LRU may be semi-optimal if we have no other options or don't know anything. But if a process does know that it's about to scan through the whole file system and basically um, get no benefit from caching, there are some systems that allow you to uh, kind of say for my upcoming uh, requests, just uh, we're going to do a use once policy um, and the file system is allowed to discard blocks as soon as they're used uh, rather than trying to cache them. And in that case, you might have a very small portion of the buffer cache that's uh, literally uh, just for transient blocks going in and out of the system. Um, and you leave the rest of the bulk of the buffer cache for other processes that are likely to get some benefit from it. Okay. Unfortunately, those interfaces are not always available, but when they are, they're very helpful when you know how you're using the file system. So now we might ask some obvious question, like uh, how much memory should the OS put for this? So DRAM is what we're using up. And we know from our previous uh, few lectures, uh, last several weeks, that uh, we have many uses for DRAM, uh, one of which is virtual memory, the other of which is the buffer cache now. So virtual memory is different from the buffer cache. Virtual memory is memory that's mapped to virtual addresses in processes, and it represents memory. Uh, the buffer cache is memory that represents files. Those are slightly different things. And so you could imagine that there's a trade-off. Uh, the more memory you have for the buffer cache, maybe the better your file system behaves, but you start getting a lot of page faults because your processes that need a lot of virtual memory uh, start faulting a lot because they're not enough physical DRAM. On the other hand, if you have too much virtual memory, then your file system might behave well because you're not getting any caching. So it's a conundrum. What do you do? All right, so what you do is in the old days, back when I first started compiling uh, versions of BSD-like file systems, you actually had a constant at the head, in the top header file, and you had to say sort of what fraction went to the buffer cache and what fraction went to the file system. And uh, this was uh, unfortunate at best because uh, you never guessed quite right, and so you ended up doing a 50-50 or something. Today, uh, you just dynamically adjust it, and so most modern operating systems kind of look at the, the miss rates in the buffer cache and the miss rates, namely page faults in the virtual memory side, and it just dynamically decides uh, how many pages go on either side. And so that's much easier. Another question you might ask is, uh, do we only pull off the disk those blocks that are actually asked for? And there's pretty good reason not to do just that. And the reason is that we know that the way POSIX file system interfaces are, uh, you don't really know up front how much data the user wants. You know, they may read a couple of bytes and close the file, or they may be reading a few bytes at a time, but then proceed to grab t a terabyte of sequential data off the disk, but doing it a few bytes at a time. Those two options, a few bytes in close or a terabyte in close, those are actually not distinguishable to the file to the file system in the short span. And so as a result, uh, it could just pull in one block at a time when it goes to read, or instead it could decide that, well, sequential reading is likely. And so uh, what it's going to do is just pull some things ahead. And so, um, so the key idea here is basically exploiting the fact that most common file access is sequential. And uh, by prefetching the subsequent disk blocks, 
we basically optimize for the, the uh, pretty common case where what's actually happening is the user is just reading uh, um, through the file sequentially, but doing so a few bytes at a time. And so often, you know, you can now ask a question of how much to read ahead. And uh, typically, I'll say that in a second. So typically, uh, a few blocks, uh, of the next few blocks of the file are almost always the right thing to do. Um, and uh, you can think of many, uh, many types of file access patterns, which are essentially sequential. Um, and so that works out really well. And um, the other thing is not just data, but also when we map an executable into memory, and demand page that executable in, which we talked about MMAP last time. Um, that also is likely to be sequential because if you start running in a particular place and you're running a um, you're running a function that's close to the end of a block, uh, you're going to want the next block. And so read prefetching, which reads a couple of blocks ahead, is pretty good optimization. And the other thing is, if we have a bunch of different prefetching going on. The nice thing to remember is the elevator algorithm, either running in the operating system, or as we mentioned more commonly these days, running on the uh, disk controller itself, uh, can take all these different prefetches and writebacks, for that matter, and interleave them in a way that optimizes for um, not seeking too much. And so uh, having a number of accesses that are queued is actually an advantage for that, from that standpoint, because it gives the uh, the scheduling of the disk blocks a chance to uh, optimize for the access pattern that happens to be in the queue. So that's pretty good. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, are we good so far? All righty. Now, what about delayed writes? And uh, so delayed writes as I've, uh, are specifically a name that is given to these writes that are in the buffer that aren't immediately sent to disk. And uh, basically, the, write, the buffer cache itself is a write back cache, clearly, right? Because you don't write through, to the buff, through the buffer cache to the disk because you, you'd blow a million instructions worth of time. The fact that it's a write back cache now uh, gives us some uh, positives and negatives. So on the positive, um, basically the write copies the data from user uh, to the kernel buffer and um, allows the user to interface on a byte level rather than on a block level. So that's pretty good. And uh, the other thing that we get is that if a user has written some data, uh, another app can read it immediately, and that data doesn't have to have gone to disk. And so we get a very fast turnaround on data written by one process and read from another without having to take that million instruction hit to go out to disk. So the cache on a positive here is transparent to user program. So that's great. Um, now, we're going to flush this to disk periodically because if we only uh, if we leave our data in memory and not to disk indefinitely, then uh, we have a pretty serious vulnerability that the moment the thing crashes, uh, we lose our data. And that would be very unfortunate. So for instance, in Linux, kind of the default is every 30 seconds or so. Okay. Uh, the other advantage of uh, delayed writes is just what I told you when I was talking about prefetching which is the fact that there are delayed writes sitting in the buffer cache means that in principle, we could choose how to send those writes to disk in a way that optimizes for uh, seeking. And uh, so the fact that there are more blocks to choose from in the buffer cache is, uh, is an advantage. So delayed writes have some pretty interesting positives to them. Another one, uh, which you might think not have thought about, is if we're, um, if we're going to try to optimize for locality, as in the fast file system uh, types of allocations we talked about last time, what we'd like to do is we'd like to have some insight into how big of a file uh, we've got. And so if a user opens a new file and starts writing a few blocks, and we have to allocate to disk immediately, then we might choose a section of the disk that isn't big enough and not have enough locality. But because we're writing into the buffer cache, we can actually have data in the buffer cache that's not yet mapped uh, 
uh, to official physical locations on the disk yet. So the data is just sitting there in the buffer cache. And as a result, if we have a set of, if we start writing and we write a bunch of blocks, then uh, by the time it's time to flush them to disk, the, uh, the allocation portion that's allocating sort of from buffer cache space to physical space can now say, oh, gee, this is a bigger file. Let me find a longer run of free blocks to write to. And so you can get better allocation as a result of delaying. So that's another advantage. Here's one that you definitely probably didn't think about, which is as a result of delayed writes, some files that are created, written, and destroyed, like temporary files, may never even have to go to disk. And so um, if you were to observe when you run a compile, you'd see that there's a lot of intermediate files that are all generated and then quickly destroyed. And as a result of delayed writes, you can, um, you can have a situation where those, those files, which are temporarily made and deleted, don't actually ever have to go to disk. So that's a pretty serious uh, advantage of delayed writes. Okay, so what's the downside? <laughs> well, there's clearly one, right? What if the system crashes before the buffer cache is flushed to disk? You lose a bunch of data. What if it was a directory files data well, now you might lose a pointer to the inode. And so not only do you lose data, but maybe you lose the existence of the file at all. Okay. Um, so there are some pretty serious consequences here from a reliability standpoint. And so this kind of leads us into uh, a pretty clear need for some sort of recovery mechanism to deal with failure. And uh, we'll talk about some here, but there's there are a number of, options that we could think about here, right? We could say that if we're writing a file and the file crashes, the file system, or the, the system crashes before we've closed the file and written it out to disk, maybe, and then flushed it to disk, maybe we consider that okay because the, uh, the process that was writing hasn't uh, reflected back to the uh, the user yet that that was even written and so maybe it's okay to lose the data so that might be a failure mode that's a little different from one that you might think about um, now there's a question here what happens if a system crashes in the middle of the write uh, what about a failure in the middle of writing to disk that gets very interesting right uh, so most file systems start with the premise that writes to disk are um, atomic somehow, so you can't get a partial write to disk. That's clearly uh, not a good assumption unless you have some way to make sure there's just enough power to finish the write you're currently working on. Some systems give you that. Um, another thing that you can do is uh, sort of a more reliable kind of thing to do is you can start by having what we'll call non-volatile RAM. We'll talk about that in a moment, where all of the writes go into this type of RAM that's battery backed up uh, right away. And then once you've verified that it's made it to disk, then you can delete it from the NVRAM. And so that's systems that are pretty serious server level systems, uh, among other things, start with NVRAM. And then they go from there and they're gonna have some form of journaling or logging, which we're gonna talk about as a topic today as well. Okay, all right. Now, so what are some of the illities we might care about? Okay, so one of the ones that we've already talked about earlier in the term is availability. Okay, by the way, you can see that the illities all end in illity, right? So availability is the probability uh, that a system can accept and process requests for sure. And this is what uh, websites and web uh, services often quote, they say, you know, I have three nines of availability, which really means that there's 99.9% .9 chance that when I go to access that website, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, something useful will happen. Now, uh, this is not necessarily as useful as you think it is, okay? This does not state that 99.9% .9 of the time something correct will happen. All it says is there'll be something there to give you a response. And so if you're out shopping for a service 
you should look carefully at what they're telling you that you got. Because if they're telling you you're getting three nines of availability, that may or may not be useful, okay? It may be useful that you get something for sure 99.9% .9 of the time, but it would be even better to know you get something correct 99.9% .9 of the time, and that's not availability, okay? Durability is also a different thing. Okay, durability is the, the, abil the ability of a system to recover data despite faults. Okay, so this is something where you say it will have 99.9% .9 durability says that 99.9% .9 of the data that's written to it will not be lost. Okay, uh, now that typically when you're getting into durability, you're much more interested in a higher number of nines, okay, five nines or, or seven nines, because data is king. That's always, uh, that's my uh, statement that I'll always make. And if you lose the data, you, there's no going back, because data, once lost, this is an entropy thing, solid physics. Once you've lo lost your data, uh, you can't get it back. And so um, I want to point out, amusingly enough, that durability is not availability. So just because it says that it's very durable doesn't mean it's available. And the pyramids, I think, are a great example of this. Uh, so once upon a time, not too long ago, the pyramids uh, had writing on them that nobody could read, OK? And what happened was eventually there was the Rosetta Stone that was discovered that allowed people to decode the, uh, the hieroglyphs that were written on the pyramids. And as a result, they uh, were suddenly able to read the data. Now that data was extremely durable. It lasted for 2000 plus years, but it wasn't really available because nobody could read it until the Rosetta Stone came along. So those two things are different. Um, and uh, finally, there's reliability, which is, what you really want most of the time, this is the ability of a system or component to perform its required function uh, under the stated conditions for a specified period of time. And it's much stronger typically than availability because it means the system's not just up, but it's working correctly. So working correctly might mean that when you do a write to an available system, you might get back an okay, but the data might be lost. Uh, if, you do, um, an, if you do a write to a durable system, you know, it might give it, it might write it there, but you're not going to be able to uh, read it again for a very long time. A reliable system will actually not only write the data, but give you a proper response back. Okay. So um, oftentimes we're going to be looking to try uh, to deal with reliable systems, not just available ones. All right. Questions? By the way, I'm going to show you uh, as we start getting into distributed file systems and, and later today in this lecture, I'm going to show you an example of where you could have durability without availability, where what you do is you encode data and you spread it um, all over the place and um, you spread the little chunks. And as long as you can recover enough of those chunks, you can get the data back. But then uh, a bunch of the, uh, the chunks of the internet go offline. Now the data is safe and you can eventually recover it, but during the period of time where parts of the net are offline, you can't. There's an amusing question here, why not call this slide abilities? Um, I don't know, because I called it illities. <laughs> no good reason, I guess. Okay. How do you make the file system durable? So disk blocks, uh, actually contain error correction codes on them to deal with small defects in the disk drive. So what you don't realize, perhaps, is when you write your data to disk, it uh, is actually encoded in a way that takes slightly more bits uh, on the physical disk than the number of bits you wrote. And these are often encoded in, excuse me, something called a Reed Solomon code. And the good thing about this is when you go to read the data back, uh, even though um, there are some errors on some of the bits. There's enough redundancy in the Reed Solomon code that you can, with very high probability, read back the data from the disk and um, you know, decode the code and get it back. And so this is essential to modern disks because the bits are so dense, they're so close together, and even with the shingled uh, type of recording I mentioned a couple of lectures ago, 
they're even on top of each other. So you definitely need error correction code to make modern disks work. And you don't have to even worry about that. It happens automatically. Um, the second thing we might do is make sure that writes survive in the short term. So this is going to be very useful when we're uh, writing to a, to a file system that's on a, on a server that, say, has delayed writes. It would be great if the writes that aren't yet persisted on disk were stored somewhere where a power outage wouldn't clobber them. And that's a good example of that is non-volatile RAM, which is uh, random access memory that actually has a little battery on it so that if power goes out, the data is still there. Uh, now, um, I will relate the following story. When I was first at Berkeley uh, N years ago, where N is larger than I'll mention, uh, we actually had a whole bunch of, re of RAID uh, disk drives uh, set up, RAID servers actually for our data, and we had a transient power outage, and we thought, oh, this isn't a problem, because uh, all our data is protected. And in fact, we lost a whole bunch of data because all of the batteries in the little NVRAMs hadn't been checked in a long time because the system essentially was never, never failed and we never had a power outage. And so even though in principle, this uh, was going to ba back up our data for us uh, or hold it in, uh, in RAM until it could be written to disk. It didn't actually happen, and we lost a whole bunch of data and had to go to uh, tape to pull it back in. Um, <laughs> so uh, moral of that story is if you have something uh, like a battery that you're relying on, you need to test it regularly. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the other th possibility in here, of course, that's uh, much more possible today is flash memory or SSDs as a short-term write before you go out to spinning storage. And uh, that is something that people do. Of course, uh, SSDs have a uh, limited amount of writing that can be done on them. So um, six and a half of one, half a baker's dozen of the other. Uh, the other thing we might want to do, so we've got the short-term survival because of the N, uh, NVRAM. The long-term survival is another question, um, which is really about replication. So uh, more than one copy of the data. So if you have it on your local server and it's replicated and uh, there's a fire in the machine room, you may have just lost your data. So the real thing you want is you want your copies to be automatically put somewhere in the cloud and spread uh, multiple continents uh, to make sure it survives. And so there's a lot of interesting ways to make data durable over the long term. So you can put copies on one disk, but if the disk fails, you can put co copies on multiple disks, but if the server fails, you can put copies on different servers, but if the building's struck by lightning, you could po put copies on servers in different continents. But if, I don't know, we're hit by a very large meteor, then you don't care anyway, so it's probably okay that the data's not uh, durable. Um, actually, maybe the aliens care, so maybe you send a copy off to the moon or something as well. So uh, one thing that I'm sure you've run into is this notion of RAID, redundant arrays of inexpensive disks. This is a Berkeley thing as well. Yay, Berkeley. Um, so Patterson and, uh, and Katz came up with this acronym. And Dave Patterson, as I like to say, is the famous uh, generator of four-letter acronyms. And uh, RAID is one of the ones he's very fam famous for, which is redundant arrays of inexpensive disks. And uh, what they were interested in here originally was instead of really expensive, huge disk drives that were really fast and uh, but um, very expensive, he wanted to put a bunch of cheap disks together uh, and sort of get the same amount of storage and same speed, but much cheaper. And uh, the problem was, of course, cheaper disks, when you have a lot of them, they fail. And so initially putting a bunch of disks together was actually a way to get uh, lower reliability. So they started uh, investigating what you could do. And uh, among other, so what they did was they started using redundancy across multiple disks. And um, this, uh, as a result of redundancy, basically gave them a way to make sure that um, even if the disks failed, they could have copies around. And as a result, they could make a RAID system uh, faster and more reliable when it was made out of a bunch of disks than these really big expensive systems. Um, and RAID, the basic idea, which I'm going to show you here, 
um, which I'm sure many of you have seen before, is uh, something that can be done either in software or hardware. And uh, for instance, if you take 262, uh, we often talk about uh, various hardware raids that were designed um, with a hardware controller, but a software uh, microcontroller on it that would uh, switch between different RAID uh, arrays and so on by HP. And so you can do this in software, you can do it in hardware, you can do some combination of both. But what's the essential idea? Well, the essential idea was laid out with five different RAID levels and uh, <laughs> RAID 1, RAID 2, RAID 3, RAID 4, RAID 5. Uh, they uh, weren't particularly um, inspirational in the way they named these things and uh, the, the different one, two, three, four, five really have nothing to do with each other. Uh, but uh, the terminology stuck. And so, um, and RAID uh, two and three are ones that you've never heard of, I'm sure, and probably won't. Four as well. So really you hear about one and five and zero and six. So what's RAID one? Well, RAID one is very simple. This is two disks. Uh, so for every place you would have put one disk, you put two, okay? And it's called mirroring. And every disk is a fully, has a fully duplicated shadow disk. Uh, and what's great about this is it's extremely simple. Every time uh, you just make uh, the disks have identical file systems on them. And every time you do a write, you write to two disks. And every time you do a read, you can actually randomly pick a disk. So as you think about this, it's got 100% overhead in capacity. So uh, you know you you're having you have two disks, but you only get one disk worth of storage. But you get twice the read rate because you can read from either disk, okay? And you get this uh, durability so that if a disk fails, you've got the other one that's a good copy. And uh, I will tell you today. Uh, these days, I never buy uh, workstations or servers that don't have at least RAID 1 because it's very easy to do. You go to a company like Dell and you configure uh, your primary disk storage and you just say, make it a RAID 1 and uh, you know just duplicate every disk you buy. And this turns out it's, it's, uh, the expense is not high and it's absolutely worth it. Um, so the bandwidth here is sacrificed on write because uh, you got to do two writes, uh, you got to write to either disk, um, and you, there's a little bit of synchronization involved, and so two disks writing to each partition and making sure that it goes out to both of them, there's a little bit of additional uh, penalty there trying to get them both written than there would be if you were just writing on one. Uh, reads can be optimized to choose from either disk, and so are faster. And recovery is uh, disk failure, you just replace the disk and copy it to a new disk. And um, in fact, you can even have systems that have a third disk that's sitting there idle or off all the time. And the moment a disk fails, you just pull the other one on. Now, uh, what I would like to point out here, for those of you that might be wondering a little bit about this, is how do you know a disk failed? Does anybody have any idea? I mean, it seems like RAID fundamentally requires you to know that a disk has failed. How would you know that? Okay, good, good idea. Checksums, everybody's thinking of checksum. It turns out that's the right idea, but I already told you, we've got error correction codes, if you remember. And so what's great about these Reed Solomon codes is they not only have enough redundancy to fix a small number of bits, but if there are too many bits that are there that are bad, they'll tell you that. And uh, so you can find out because you go to read an item off the disk and the ECC code says this is a fail. Okay. Another one that's pointed out here, which is also good, is not responding. Yeah. So both the, uh, the codes report a read failure or the disk controller itself isn't responding. Um, either of those are reasons to uh, assume that the disk is failed. And what we do in that instance is we just sort of mentally put a whole X over the full disk and assume that it's completely broken and, uh, and then copy from uh, the good disk to a new disk. And so this is what's called an erasure code because we've erased, say, this pink disk because we know it's bad 
um, and then we copy the green one to another one. Okay, and so it's uh, so RAID is fundamentally an erasure coding style of uh, of access. And so the other thing that you could imagine here is if you lose a few blocks on the disk, that's going to be indicated because again of the error correction code. At that point you could uh, copy from the green disk to a, a spare block you've allocated on the disk, but the moment that blocks start failing, it's usually a pretty good predictor that that disk is starting to go out and it's very soon that you better get a new disk in there. Okay, RAID 5, so, so the problem with RAID 1 is it's 100% uh, overhead, okay? But it's really fast because uh, you can write as, as fast as one disk, uh, which is you know pretty good, and you can read uh, twice the rate. With RAID 5 or 5 plus, uh, what you do is you have a, a set of disks. So here's five disks that are all going to be cut, uh, put together. And what we do is we imagine a disk group, which is take the same set of blocks across all five disks, and four of them, for instance, are going to be considered data, and the fifth one is going to be parity. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that stripe unit and we're going to uh, take all four of the disks, XOR them together, and put the result on the parity disk. And for a moment, and, uh, for a reason I'll tell you in a moment, we're going to rotate that parity across the different disks. And so if you notice, we sort of change which, di which disk has the parity on it. Okay. And so this parity computation, for instance, P0 equals D0, uh, D0 plus D1 plus D2 plus D3, has this nice property that it's idempotent. So you can do it over and over again, and you always get the same result. And it doesn't matter which of these five disks fails. It could be P0, could be D2, could be D0. Whatever disk fails, I can get the other, I can get it back by basically rerunning XOR across them. So if disk zero fails, I just XOR the remaining four disks and I'll get what di disk zero is supposed to be. Okay, that's this nice property of RAID 5. Okay. Um, so again, supposing that disk three fails, then disk uh, two, for instance, here is recomputed as XORing D0, D1, D3, P0 together. I could get back disk six, or uh, excuse me, um, block D6 by XORing D4, D5, P1, D7, etc. All right. So um, this is a very simple code. It's easy to implement in a disk controller, and uh, it's easy to buy a disk controller at uh, any server company or workstation company you can name, and they will have the ability to do RAID 5. Okay. And uh, this trick that I've shown you here, notice that uh, it doesn't have to be five disks. It could be four. It could be seven. Um, what you're doing is you're taking the group of disks, and you're having one parity to it. Uh, what happens if disk three fails? and I put a new disk in and I'm doing this uh, reconstruction process to rewrite all the data and another disk fails, what happens? So I'm in the middle of uh, copying to disk three prime and uh, disk four fails, what, what happens here? Well, you lose data, exactly. So you needed something more here, okay? Yeah, cry, yep, it's happened. Uh, so um, that's an issue. Basically, this scheme, RAID 5, only gives you one protection against one disk, and after one disk has failed, you better hurry up and copy to a new disk before the next disk fails or you're toast, okay? Now, um, the other thing I'll point out, so one thing I pointed out is you can, these disks, one, two, three, four, five, could be spread all over the internet uh, and give you this reliability, uh, which is kind of fun. The other thing that I will point out is even while you're reconstructing, so even while I'm uh, replacing uh, D2, D6, P2, et cetera, I can get these ones that I haven't reconstructed yet uh, and hand them off to somebody who's trying to read them. So I can actually have a RAID system that's in the middle of being reconstructed that's still servicing reads and writes 
from uh, another process, but it gets a little tricky. And especially if you're trying to service writes, um, you probably want to freeze out all writes until you return your parity. Now, today's disks are so big that RAID 5 is a no-no, okay? So if you're building a system with RAID 5, you probably need to stop and think because you're doing the wrong thing. And the reason is that the disks are so big that this reconstruction process, suppose disk three, three fails, I put a new one in there that's another four terabyte disk. The time it takes to reconstruct all the data, all four terabytes of the data, uh, easily opens up a hole whereby we could lose another disk and then we've lost all of our data and that would be bad. Okay, so what do we do? We need to allow more disks to fail and it's not gonna be this way. So if I add disk six into this parity group, all that means is I still can only lose one of them, but now I have sort of a higher probability of losing one or losing more because as I add more disks, the probability of failure goes up. So what I really need is something else. And the answer is, um, in general, uh, so RAIDs are a form of erasure code. And what we're really saying here is that disk three was erased. And I need to be able to replace an erasure. And so in order to deal with this, I need to have more erasures, okay? And so today, there's a, what you can look for is you should look for at least RAID 6, okay? Which is RAID 6 uh, controllers are ones that allow you to have two disks worth of parity and allow two disks to fail. And so the good thing about that is when the first one fails, assuming you have one ready to go, the second one can go forward, okay? Okay, and uh, unfortunately, you need something more complicated than just XOR. And uh, there's an example I have up in the reading, for instance, the even odd code, uh, which you guys should check out if you're curious. Um, the other is something that I want to mention, the Reed solomon codes that we mentioned from the DISC uh, discussion earlier are useful in general. And so um, the, the simple thing that I'll say about Reed solomon codes is the following, all right? You can, uh, if you remember from uh, when you first took algebra, what you learned was if you have a polynomial like this, uh, P of X equals uh, coefficient A plus AX plus, uh, you know, A sub 2 X squared, et cetera, et cetera. This polynomial's values are fully defined by the coefficients, okay? Which means that if you take, I suppose this is uh, M minus 1 here. If I have M points and I, and I get M points, I say X of Z, uh, P, X of 0, and X of 1, and 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, if I get M of those, then that'll be enough points to reconstruct the polynomial. And so Reed solomon codes can be thought of this way, where if I have more points than just M, suppose I have a lot of points like N, or say N is four times M, then as long as I can get any M of those points, I can reconstruct the polynomial. And if my data is these uh, coefficients, A0, A1, A2, A3, that means I can get my data back by fitting this polynomial. Now, I'm not going to go into this now. Those of you that have taken security have probably run into Galois fields, which uh, are basically finite versions like the real numbers that let you have these properties like polynomial. But what they do is they give you this M of N property, which is extremely cool. And I wanted to show you this M of N property. So what is this M of N property again? It says that if I have M data points here, and I encode it with a polynomial, so I have n, where n is bigger than m, as long as I get any m back, I can reconstruct my data. And so I can, it's like a hologram. I could have n points where n is four times m, and as long as any n of them come back, I'm good. And so if you imagine a server situation in the internet as a whole, you send out n copies, and as long as you can get back m from anywhere, you get the data back. And uh, here's a, a fun graph here, which says that I do the following. Suppose I put four copies of my data out, and every six months I find uh, the copies that are out there, and I make sure that I keep replicating so I still have four copies. All right, that's kind of boring and simple. If instead I do the following, I encode with an erasure code, and I send out 64 little pieces, any 16 of which are enough to reconstruct, the total overhead of this 16 of 64 code is the same as the four copies of a code. 
But in the first case, I might lose 3% uh, of my blocks per year just to, due to failure under these circumstances. And in the second case, I'm going to lose 10 to the minus 35 uh, blocks of data in a year. So uh, erasure coding basically makes your data extraordinarily hard to damage, which gets us back to extreme durability. OK. So uh, if we wanted to really make sure our data is durable, we could now use a file system that actually stores out in the cloud somewhere where we have fragments, say 64 servers out there. And as long as we can get back from some 16 of them, we can reconstruct our data. This is extremely durable. It's not as available necessarily because it might mean that I have to reach out to 16 of these servers reconstruct using the code before I get my data, but boy, is it durable. And this is like a digital pyramid from the standpoint of really hard to destroy your data. And so um, it's a nice way to make sure that you basically never lose your data. OK. All right. Now, uh, what if uh, a disk loses power or software crashes? Uh, some operations in progress may complete. Some may be lost. Uh, you may overwrite a block only partially. So you may have a disk block on disk that's sort of half written. And notice that RAID, even that extreme form of RAID I just showed you with Reed Solomon codes, doesn't really help a bad state of the file system. All it says is that if I have some data, I can make sure the bits are uh, hard to destroy. But if the bits are wrong because I have a transient state, a partial state of the file system, then all I've done is made sure that those ba that bad state of the file system is uh, extremely durable and will last forever. Okay, so uh, I have to I have to think a little bit more about the actual semantics of my file system in order to preserve my data. So of course, file systems as a whole want some form of durability just as a minimum. And so the question is not just how do I make bits durable, but how do I make the file system durable? And that really means that previous data that's stored can be retrieved, maybe after some recovery step, regardless of the failure that might be going on. And now this starts to get a little interesting for us. Okay? So the storage reliability problem is as follows. We have a single logical file operation, like a write, but it might update a bunch of different physical disk blocks might update the inode, it might update an indirect block, like say you uh, just extended your file past block uh, 10 on the original BSD, and so now all of a sudden you've got to allocate a new indirect block and then a new block and so on. So there might be the inode gets updated, the indirect block gets updated, the data block gets updated, the free bitmap gets updated. So one operation updates a whole bunch of things, and as a result, you might end up with garbage uh, in one of, or more of these things. And so the, that single update that you tried to do, consisting of a bunch of different pieces, never actually happened properly. And once you get sector remapping, like in Flash or whatever, a single update to a physical disk block might require multiple updates to sectors under some circumstances where you have to move and reallocate and so on. So. So at the physical level, operations complete one at a time, but we want, and we want concurrent operations for performance, but we also want this reliability. So how do we guarantee consistency regardless of when the crash occurs? And this is an interesting problem in itself for how to design file systems. And I showed you how to make sure that data, once you've encoded it in a RAID or sent it out or whatever and written all those disks, that's extremely durable, but we have to get to there from the writes that the user does. So what are some threats to reliability here? So interrupted operation, so a crash or power failure in the middle of a series of related updates uh, could leave this uh, data inconsistent state. Um, you know, transferring funds from one bank account to another and it sort of half happens or whatever. Uh, what if the uh, transfer is interrupted after you withdraw and before you deposit? Okay, so now the data, the, data, the money is just gone, right? Um, you could lose some stored data, like the uh, non-volatile storage media, like a disk, may just cause the previously stored data to fail. Now, this is uh, a good situation, or be corrupted. This is a good situation where RAID and some of the techniques like Reed Solomon can start to help us. Okay. So one approach 
is really carefully order things. So we're going to sequence our operations in a specific order uh, and carefully design our file system to allow sequences to be interrupted safely. Okay, and if things are interrupted because the system crashes, we're going to have some sort of post-crash recovery when we reboot the system to read in the data structures to see if there were any operations in progress at the time and then clean up or finish as needed. And this is actually the approach taken by a lot of things, by the FAT file system, the FF, uh, FAST file system, uh, et cetera. And what there is, for instance, on uh, FF, uh, FAST file system or Linux, there's something called FSCK, which uh, basically goes in and tries to make the file system consistent after a potential failure. All right. And there's also a lot of application level recovery schemes where if you have a file uh, in a regular format like Word or Emacs or whatever with auto saves and a crash occurs, the applications sometimes try to recover for you as well by looking at previous versions of the data. So this is pretty ad hoc. Um, for the interest, for instance, in the case of the fast file system, you know, you create a file very carefully. So normally you allocate a data block, you write the data block, you allocate an inode, you write an inode. You update the bitmap to say the blocks are now no longer free. You, then you update the directory with the file name to inode number. So notice this careful order that I've come up with here. If I fail anywhere along the road here, I'm probably still mostly OK. So um, I might allocate a data block. If I fail there, it doesn't matter because uh, I haven't updated the free map yet. I might write the data. Well, if I crash. That might be OK. I'll lose that data, but nothing will be inconsistent. I might allocate an inode for the new file. OK, well, if it crashes, the file goes away. I might write an inode. Uh, and if it crashes, the file might go away. I might update the bitmap. OK, now, by the time I get to this point, now I've got uh, an update that's hopefully done atomically where there's a new inode that's got file data in it. But if I crash, it's not in a directory yet. Well, then I want to have some consistency thing that goes and finds free inodes that are dangling but have data in them to put in a directory. And uh, you know, it may not know which directory it was supposed to go in, but it can put it at the top level, et cetera. So if you notice, how do I recovery? I scan the inode table. If there are any unlinked files, um, I might delete them or put them in a lost and found directory, compare the free bitmap against inode trees, scan directories for missing updates, et cetera. I can go through a fairly extensive process to try to recover from updates in uh, one of these places. OK. As you can imagine, there are a number of ways this can not work out the way we might like, but it mostly works. And so uh, this is uh, called the FSCK, gets run at boot time. It will figure out whether uh, mostly the file system's in a good state, and it'll put it back in a consistent state uh, and hopefully recover most of your data. All right. And of course, the time for recovery is proportional to disk size. So if you got a terabyte drive and you had a major crash, that FSCK might take a long time. But boy, if you have a 16 terabyte drive or a 100 terabyte drive, I told you about the uh, the flash drive uh, last time or two times ago, then it's going to take a really long time to recover as well. So this is probably not great. The other idea is I might do a copy on write file layout. Oh, and by the way, this idea here of working my way through is kind of like uh, it's got a single commit point kind of at the end here where I put the, the inode into the directory. And that's the point at which everything succeeds. But this is not really as clean as a transaction. All right. So another option would be a copy on write file layout where we update the file system. We write a new version of the file containing the update. Never update anything in place. So if a, if a write fails, we never uh, cause a problem. And we might reuse uh, existing unchanged data blocks for our new writes. Now, there was a question here, do we ever roll back changes for recovery, or do we just continue through those normal operations? Um, so once recovery has started, 
uh, it's usually very hard to roll back anything recovery does. And so it's making changes to your file system that are often, un you can't undo them. Uh, and in back before journaling came in, which uh, we'll talk about either at the end of the lecture or maybe next time, um, it was possible to have an FSCK operation that started um, freeing up a bunch of your directories because it thought they were inconsistent and you could actually lose data. And there was, it was very hard to recover from that. So um, what you do in a really bad scenario is you make sure to make a raw copy of all the blocks and then you run the recovery on it. But I'm going to show you something that's better uh, when we get to journaling here. So, uh, so to update a file system, um, we never update in place with a copy on write file system and we reuse unchanged disk blocks to, um, to keep track of the state of the file system. So we're going to reuse everything that's not changed as much as possible and only write new stuff to new blocks. Seems expensive. So you can think of this as every change to a file makes a brand new version of the file in a way that every version of the file is kind of available simultaneously. It seems expensive, but when you're making the new version of the file, the old one's always around. So if anything bad happens, you don't lose the old version of the file. Okay. Almost all disk writes can occur in parallel in a system like this because we're not destroying any data. We're just adding data. And this is the approach taken in a lot of network server uh, appliances like NetApps, Write Anywhere File Layout, that's Waffle or ZFS from Sun Oracle or Open ZFS. And here's an example, for instance, of a copy on write with smaller Radix blocks. And so here is a file system uh, or a file, for instance, with an inode tree that kind of uh, we're doing, I'm doing binary here to make it simple. But notice how this blue is all the existing data and this file has data up to the end of this blue and I'm about to write as an append to this file. So in a regular file system of the type we've been talking about, you just overwrite this disk block by adding new data at the end. In a copy on write file system, you allocate a brand new block, copy the data to the new block, add the new data, and then build a tree representing the new file where every block that I haven't changed or every tree that I haven't changed is linked into the new file. And only this thing at the very end here, notice this lower block was pointed at the previous, uh, this lower uh, indirect block was pointed at the previous uh, block, but I have a new one which takes the, the left branch because that's unchanged, but it has the new block on the right. And so now I have two versions of the file that are simultaneously there. And the only thing that's different data is the intermediate nodes and the, uh, the block I've just written. And as a result, I have a very nice uh, atomic change where the old version gets replaced by the new version in some directory in a way that uh, basically doesn't risk any data until we've actually done the swap. And in principle, in fact, if we do the same thing with the directories, we can keep around as many old versions as we would like. Okay, and there's file systems that work this way. So ZFS is a great example of that. Okay, so it has variable size blocks, uh, 512 bytes up to 128 kilobytes. It's a symmetric tree of the form that I just showed you. So it knows if uh, it's large or small when we make the copy. Store the version number with the pointers. And so I can have multiple versions simultaneously in the file system I can easily undo. Buffers writes before creating a new version with them so that potentially uh, I could do, if I have a bunch of writes that I do in a row, it can buffer them up and do one of these trees for the new writes uh, at once. And so that will uh, save a little bit of the versioning and also give the operating system a little time to figure out kind of how big the new file is going to be after the writes are done. Okay. Uh, and free space is a tree of extents in each block group. Uh, so we can de delay updates to the free space and do them all when the block group's activated, et cetera. So there's a bunch of tricks to optimize that basic copy on write that I showed you. But this is indeed a file system that does copy on write and has really strong uh, reliability, even under flaky scenarios where uh, a lot of writes are happening and things crash. Uh, which you might see in a distributed file system, for instance. Okay, and ZFS or OpenZFS, those are uh, available for you guys, even as Linux file systems, you could use this if you want. So what are some more general solutions? 
Well, more general solutions uh, other than copy on write are things like transactions. So we could put together all of these different operations that I mentioned, all the different inode and directory operations that have to happen together, together in some sort of transaction and then do commit. And either, what's a transaction mean? Well, either everything commits or nothing commits. And so as a result, the file system's never inconsistent, okay? And so what we wanna do with transactions is ensure that multiple related updates are performed atomically. And for instance, if a crash occurs, uh, we uh, just revert by throwing out all the partially done transactions and we just make sure they don't have any impact on the state of the file system. And uh, as a result, the file system itself is never inconsistent. And furthermore, this, is, uh, this idea of throwing out all the partially uh, done transactions is actually a pretty good uh, semantic to give to a user because what they know is that you only tell them that a write is completed after it has tr transactionally committed. And as a result, they never are under the false illusion that something has uh, been written properly to the file system until it actually has been written. And um, you can provide some redundancy for me media failures um, by making sure, for instance, you don't commit a transaction until after you have uh, written everything to all of the drives in a, in a RAID group, for instance, or replicated out to the file system. So you can trade off performance for redundancy in a system like this as well and make a decision as to when you say a transaction's actually committed. So what's a transaction? So transactions are set of, uh, is closely related to critical sections, uh, as we mentioned. So uh, atomic sections, back when we were talking about locking, remember, either everything happens or nothing happens, and there's only one thing in the transaction at a time. And so they're extending the concept of atomic updates from memory to stable storage. And we're gonna basically atomically update a set of persistent data structures stored on disk in a way that keeps our file system consistent. There's many ad hoc approaches. So what I showed you earlier with the fast file system, carefully ordering the sequence of updates is kind of a handcrafted ad hoc transaction where only the very last thing really commits the file to the directory. Um, the, uh, but the key concept here of the transaction is uh, as follows, okay? An atomic sequence of actions reads or writes on a storage system that takes you from one consistent state to another. And so what we want is consistent state one has a set of data through a transaction takes us to consistent state two, which maybe represents a new file is created or some data has been updated. And there are no inconsistent states. We only go from one to another. And what we know from our discussion of file systems is that means whatever a transaction means, it has a set of things that happen together as a unit to get us from that consistent state one to two. And we need to make sure that when we go from one to two, we always do all of those things or we just stay in consistent state one. There's no half state, okay? So here's an example of a typical idea. You begin the transaction, you do a bunch of updates. If any of them fail, you just roll back and throw everything out and then you commit. Okay, so here's your classic example where I wanna transfer data uh, from Alice's account to Bob's. I'll do a begin transaction and I do a bunch of things together Okay, of transferring, pulling data out of Alice's account, putting it into Bob's, and then I commit. And the idea behind the transactional system is that all of these things happen or none of them happen. And so we don't lose any money in the process. Okay, that's as we talked about this uh, early in the term. Okay, so um, things that we want to get out of transactions are atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. I'll talk. Uh, potentially more about that. I'm running low on time here, but I wanted to sort of give you the idea of what our basic approach is gonna be here. We'll pick this up on Thursday. But one simple action becomes atomic, uh, it becomes an atomic sequence of actions. So here we have a bunch of different things that we wanna to put together and we write them in a log. And you know, meanwhile, other stuff is happening, blue things and the green things and the, and the uh, whatever that is, puce things. And they're all happening in the log together, but how do I make sure that either all of these things or nothing happen? Well, I do it very simply. I say start transaction at the beginning, and the fact that we've written all these things in the log uh, 
has no impact on the abstract state of the system until I do one last write of commit. And the moment that I say commit, then all of these things that are part of that transaction are abstractly and simultaneously uh, committed to the system. Okay, and what's great about this is it's a single write, which we make sure happens atomically, commits all of these things. Okay, and if we don't get around to that single write, then it's as if these things never happened. And if we do that single write, then it's as if they absolutely all happened. And the real trick is gonna be, how do we apply this to file systems, where what's gonna be in the middle here is gonna be you know, allocate an inode, uh, make a directory modification, do some writes, and a single commit in our log will suddenly say, oh, that happened. And the absence of a commit will be, oh, it didn't happen, okay? And so next time, we're gonna really kind of show you how to do this. We're gonna basically get better reliability through the use of a log, okay? So all changes, are gonna be treated as transactions. Transactions are gonna be committed once they're written to the log, and then we're gonna have data forced out to the log for reliability. It might be forced into NVRAM uh, to make things fast. And um, although the file system may not be updated immediately, the data is preserved in the log. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if we have a bunch of writes to different things like inodes and directory pieces and so on, and then we say commit, even though we haven't updated our file system, the fact that these are in the log means that anybody trying to read the data after recovery takes into account all of these things as if they were applied to the file system and acts as if they were applied to the file system and the user doesn't have to know the difference. Okay, and that's gonna be how we make this atomic. Okay, and so now there's uh, the difference between log structured and journaled, which we're gonna come up with soon, uh, is that a log structured file system, the data stays in the log, whereas in a journal file system, the log is just used for recovery and it's a transient place for uh, holding information until it's committed. So just like I said here, in a journaled system, these might say write to this I know, do that, write this data and so on. We say commit. In a log structured file system, the data would just stay there and we'd have to figure out how to uh, go through the pointers in this actual uh, log to get us our data. Whereas in a journal file system, we would transfer all of these updates to the real file system that might be laid out like a fast file system. And then once we've done that, we can throw out the data in the log. So the journal in the journaled case is only used to help us in the case that we crash between the time we hit commit and the time that we've transferred all of these things over to the file system. All right, so we'll get to that next time. Um, and many journaling file systems out there, and you're probably using one today, okay? And it's basically uh, updates to system metadata using transactions happen in all of them. Updates to non-directory files like user data can be done in place without the logs or can be done uh, with full logging. We'll show you how that is. And I'm gonna name just a few, NTFS, Apple HFS Plus, uh, Linux S XFS, JFS, EXT3, EXT4, you name it. They have journaling in there to give you better reliability. Um, okay, so uh, there was some question about is there hardware support for parallel writes in the context of a transaction? The nice thing about transactions is you can write, uh, as long as your, your log data is kept consistent and serial in order, then you can write out to the file system in parallel without any problem. All right, so finishing up, uh, we'll, we'll pick this up next time, but we talked about file systems to transform blocks into files and directories. Um, we're optimizing for size, access, and usage patterns, uh, and uh, that may be how we build our inode structures. Uh, remember in NTFS, we built a slightly different uh, database instead of inodes. Uh, we might be trying to maximize sequential access to allow uh, for really fast uh, access for things like uh, videos and so on, but still have efficient random access. And then we have to figure out how to, uh, you know, provide protection. Okay, a file, as we mentioned, is defined by the header called the inode um, or things in the master system table like an NTFS. Naming is the process of walking through the user visible names, which is scanning through the directories. Okay, multi-level index schemes like uh, the inodes for uh, NTFS or, um, or FS, uh, the FAST file system. Uh, 
are basically part of the file system structure. We talked about the, the layout driven by how free space is happening and how we want to make sure that we have performance. Uh, we're going to talk next time about flash file systems. And so we're going to pick up there. Uh, we're going to pick up with logging and then uh, we'll end with flash file systems. We also talked about uh, the buffer cache and uh, what that's about. Okay, so I'm going to let you all go and we're going to pick this up on Thursday. I hope you guys all have a great uh, end of your night and Wednesday, and we'll see you on Thursday. All right. Um, and uh, in terms of questions about midterm two, uh, we'll be answering that on Piazza. All right. We'll see you all uh, later, and I'm going to end the recording now. Bye now.